Uh, good afternoon. Uh, yeah, it's delayed. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third day of uh, online feminist conference organized by uh, Struzhani. Uh, I hope you enjoy the last uh, two days. Uh, today, I, uh, I welcome you with us, uh, Diana Young, uh, our um, friend, an activist, a teacher, and educator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I can say so, uh, who will be talking about intersectionality, but well, let's say from a more critical point of view on what it is and what it's not. Uh, so it's definitely going to be very interesting as always, Diana, welcome, welcome. Uh, with us. How are you? <laughs> no, no, thank you very much. It's always very nice to see you. And um, yeah, I mean, hopefully there'll be enough, uh, enough here for people to have some interest in. Um, yeah, I mean, well, what sure. I need to do is, um, is go through a, like a series of themes. Um, there's so much I could say on this because it's been quite an interest for a while. Um, and hopefully what we could do is like introduce a theme. So that we're going to talk about racism, talk about populism, talk about different strands within Marxist theory and so forth. So if somebody's got a particular say, well, I'd like to talk more about this particular thing. Then hopefully if people will put um, uh, questions in the chat, I think here or on Facebook or wherever you're watching this, <laughs> if anyone's watching this. Yeah, great, that, that sounds amazing. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, if you can, yeah, if you guys have any questions, just feel free to write it in chat. And um, if, um, uh, yeah, and that will be answered, I guess, after, after Diana, after you will uh, finish speaking. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen because it's a, there's a, um, I don't have to remember how to do this. I'm going to share my screen because there's a, um, I'm going to do like a PowerPoint presentation and that should give you a, a little, little bit of structure to the, to the talk. And so as I don't, and also so as I don't linger too long on a particular um, particular topic. So this is me, this is what the topic, what it is and what it isn't. And so um, one of the things which I need to pay attention to is that um, intersectionality is a bit of a totem for, uh, for so many different people. Um, for example, I think um, I introduced a, a criticism of intersectionality on an LGBT a group, and I was described as I was described as a turf and a crypto fascist, which I thought was a little bit unkind, and simply for criticizing or, or yeah, voicing a criticism of intersectionality. Um, I have a, a very good friend who's a trans man, and he lives in the US, and like me, he's a teacher. And like me, he teaches a subject called theory of knowledge. And his view is that it is not possible to criticize intersectionality. It is above criticism. So for many people, especially in the LGBT community, this is, this is a totem, something um, that hold back, holds onto, um, because it, it represents something uh, fundamental to them. The other thing which I, I think, um, need to bear in mind is that intersectionality has gone beyond um, a, a form of analysis and has been institutionalized. Uh, and I invite anybody, <laughs> anybody gets bored, it's to Google LSE gender studies. And you look at the homepage of LSE gender studies and it says that it is, um, it is committed to interdisciplinary, intersectional, and transnational um, study or work. Now, I cannot think of any, I mean, for example, if, if it was, um, it sounds a bit like Marxist Leninist Institutes in Czechoslovakia in the 19, 1980s, that it is an institutional form of, uh, form of analysis. So it is something which is a totem, which has been drawn into the very heart of the academy. And so this is why, and it and it's defended in quite vitriolic terms by, by its supporters. Um, and so this is, this is why I'm going to say what it is and what it isn't uh, and try and 
uh, and try and be respectful because I need, I recognize that so many people have invested so much in intersectionality as a, as a way forward. Okay, so I'm gonna try and do this very briefly because I, I presume that many people uh, know a great deal about Kimberly Kirsch Crenshaw and, and her development and so forth. But I'm going to ask a number of questions about the late 80s and early 90s. And so my question was, would be, why did this emerge in the end of the 1980s? Um, so I'm just going to um, take some time over this uh, and see how we go. Term intersectionality is accredited to legal scholar Kimberly Kershaw in an article she wrote in 1989, which is called Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, Feminist Theory and Anti-Racist Politics. Now there's a bit of a, a, bit of a clue in the title of this, and it's the idea about anti-discrimination doctrine, because Kimberly Crenshaw is a legal scholar. And so what she's interested in is anti-discrimination, things which are actionable. And so a discrimination might be based upon um, sex or discrimination might be based upon um, uh, race. But what we're looking here is, is what she says is the inter-discrimination, in, how should put it, the intersection of these things. And so what she sees is that, um, that there is a gap in some cases. And the, the legal example she used um, showed that it was not possible for somebody to claim uh, discrimination on the basis of being black and a woman. So I think that's quite an interesting point that we need to bear in mind. Um, feminist accounts of the origins are frequently traced to the experience of black women and other women of color and to black feminist thought, particularly the Combahee River Collective, uh, which they state, we believe that sexual politics under patriarchy is as pervasive in black women's lives are the politics of class and race. We also find it difficult to separate race from class, from sex oppression, because in our lives, they are most often expressed simultaneously. And so what we, what we notice is that if we go further and further back, and I'm conscious here that I don't want to go too much on this, um, that this intersection of race, class, and gender um, has been recognized, especially within uh, black feminism, um, for generations. And so the question is, why was it necessary to reinvent this, um, uh, how should we, this, in, well, let's call it an intersection, this, um, this, this meeting, um, if it had already been raised beforehand? Because not um, in between Kimberly Kershaw and the Combahee River Collective, we have the excellent book, and I recommend anyone to read this, of, from Angela Davis, which is Women, Race and Class, uh, in which he historically, this is a big difference between, um, big difference between intersectionalism and Angela Davis, is Angela Davis's book is uh, very embedded with the historical record. Uh, Claudia Jones was a, a, an activist, but also a journalist, um, in the first half of the 20th century. And she, again, brings this forward. It's a very good book that came out last, last year from Susan Ferguson, which is, about, um, which is about work. I can't remember the proper title, but it's in the bibliography. Um, that Claudia Jones brought forward the idea that working class black women also, also work and about the centrality of work for uh, working class black women. We could even go much further back. We could go back to 1851 and the famous speech by Sojourner Truth in which she, as a black working class woman, reasserted her, herself in, in, the, how should I say, in relation to the white suffrage movement. So the question remains, what is there about the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, which means that it is necessary for Kimberly Crenshaw to re- redefine this race, class, and gender. And I would suggest that it has a great deal to do with Marxism um, and that, um, that intersectionality is consciously 
non-Marxists. I mean, according to uh, Aguila in the collection Marxism and, uh, and Feminism, she says that intersectionality is anti-Marxist. I mean, I'm going to suggest that it's post-Marxist rather than anti-Marxist, but I don't think it, I don't, I don't think they did it, but, but a number of commentators have pointed out they say it's anti-Marxist, at least anyway. Um, okay, I'm going to jump forward a wee bit um, and talk about uh, feminism and racism. And, and again, I think this is one of the, the points at which it answers the question of where, here we are. The question I want to keep in mind is, is why did inter intersectionality develop in the 1990s? Remember the first article from Crenshaw is 1989, and why then? So we're quick, frequently told the need for intersectionality was provoked by the exclusion of the so-called so mainstream feminism. Um, and so in some ways, intersectionality is not aimed at the broader society, and in many cases, it's aimed at um, what is called mainstream feminism, or recently the phrase white feminism has been introduced. And I would, I would suggest that anyone reads a, a very good book which came out um, two years ago, uh, which is by somebody called Jennifer Nash, uh, and it's called um, After Intersectionality. And she points out that this, this tension between mainstream feminism and black feminism is, is very real. And I would, I would look at the um, example from two examples. I mean, I'm jumping around a wee bit here, uh, but I'll, I'll use the example of Sheila Smith Firestone. So she released what must be regarded as a foundation text of radical feminism. Now, this came out in 1970, but if you look at the, um, if you look at the um, Helen Hester's Xenofeminism, which came out in 20, um, 2018, or if you look at Lola Olufemi's uh, Feminism Interrupted, which came out, I think, last year, they make direct and frequent reference to this, which I would say is anti-trans and it is racist as well. So it's curious that this has maintained some sort of credence over the time. Um, it is important that we consider this book um, partly because chapter five is notoriously racist. Firestone develops a construct defining uh, the white man as the father, the white woman as the mother of a wife, and black people as children. In Firestone readings of Freud's Oedipus complex, she implies that black men harbor an uncontrolled desire for sexual relations with white women as revenge on the white father. Regardless of the clever psychoanalytical framing device, Firestone is simply saying that white women should be afraid of black men who are essentially rapists. Now, yeah, I could be, this could be hyperbole in my point, but this is the view of Angela Davis. So Angela Davis writes in 1981, this sub-Freudian racist view simply promotes a myth of black male sexuality and that black men are rapists. She goes on to note that, quote, the fictional image of the black man as rapist has always strengthened its inseparable companion, the image of the black woman as chronically promiscuous. The entire race is invested with bestiality. So if we look at um, dialectic sex in its entirety, um, I'm not gonna go over this um, great deal, but it does have um, some pertinence for trans people. Um, it does baffle me really that this is still such a central text. Uh, and so if anyone in the questions can explain why chapter five is still uh, held up as a reasonable understanding of uh, gender relations, then please let me know. Um, so this I think is the context, given that this, is, this was radical feminism, and given that this had such a voice in the 70s and 80s, then I can then to some extent I can understand this. But this is this is about racism, not in the broader society, but racism within a particular branch of feminism. Um, I'm going to move on to this, uh, which is a discussion, very brief discussion, 
but one which I would like to maybe develop in the questions af afterwards is the relationship between intersectionality and the populism of Laclau and Muth, two uh, wonderful uh, thinkers. I mean, I, I wouldn't um, take anything from them, um, but they're best described as post-Marxists um, because the fundamental, if anyone has read this book, I would, I would suggest that everyone should read this book. It's a very good book, um, but it is, um, and I would recommend reading this because it represents a particular um, a period of left politics at the end of, end of the 1980s. Um, it might be, this is just I'm floating this idea, that it's not simply about uh, racism and it's not simply about um, populism, but 1989, when Crenshaw makes this um, initial foray into intersectionality, 1989 is a date which has different resonances in this part of the world. So is there any connection between 1989 and the collapse of realized socialism and the opportunity presented that that presented to somebody, somebody like Crenshaw and Muth, who were who basically are, are post-Marxists. Um, there's lots I could do in this. There's far too much I could say about this. And so what I'm going to do is try and uh, simplify this. Um, so we've got plenty here about, I've got something, uh, prior expressions of race, class, and gender, but I'm going to jump forward. Um, yeah, so Laclau and Muth, project is to provide an alternative hegemonic discourse to bring about social change. Social change is not deterministic in that it is not inevitable. And so a lot of the ideas which they're putting forward are a mis, well, to my mind, they're a misrepresentation of Marx. This idea that it is mechanistic, that it is um, um, de um, um, economic determinism, and that the social change is inevitable I think is a misrepresentation. Um, so social change is not deterministic, it is not inevitable, it is pluralistic, it does not have a single privileged political actor such as, surprise, surprise, the working class, as this will not be sufficient to mobilize enough people to generate social change. Now, the belief all the way through, remember this was written in the 1980s, um, and I remember the 1980s as, um, as a period where it was possible to mobilize, uh, mobilize um, working people in mass strikes, not simply within the UK, but across the board. And there was, a, there, was a, there was a evident struggle between the ruling class and the working class. And yet, um, at the same time, um, Laclau and Mufa saying, no, that's no longer a, an option. Uh, it would, there is, will not be sufficient to mobilize enough people to generate social change. Uh, and so if we take the, uh, um, if we take the example of the, the minor strike, um, it is quite evident that there is a feminist reading of the minor strike. It is quite evident that LGBT people got involved within the minor strike. And so without dismissing the working class, the working class can be seen as a magnet for other, um, other social movements. Um, thirdly, it requires a discourse. Remember, this is Laclau, so it's all about discourse. It requires a discourse to articulate strategic goals and to frame power and inequality as oppression. So this is quite interesting because it is a key word within intersectionality, uh, oppression. A number of Marxist commentators have pointed out that we use the word oppression within uh, intersectionality rather than exploitation. But where did exploitation go? And so I would suggest that there is a great deal of commonality between Laclau and Muth and, uh, and intersectionality, not just the fact that they're writing at the same time, but they are um, imagining a world where the working class and capitalism doesn't exist. And so what do we do with the end of the working class? Um, I've lost my place. Um, uh, what is needed is a story 
to mobilize multiple social groups under one umbrella. It is a discourse of liberty and equality that frames this antagonism. Laclau and Mouffe identify successful social movements in those which construct a hegemonic discourse, which is based on the established social inequality, secondly, an ability to be agile and to move from social class to areas of inequality. So what I'm not, what I'm not talking about, this is not written by an intersectionality author. This is Laclau and Mouffe in the middle of the 1980s. Social movements need to unite multiple social groups and not simply mobilize the working class. There is also a need to provide viable alternatives for the reconstruction of society. There is a need to sketch what an alternative to society looks like and a recognition of equivalent of these multiple struggles. So there is plenty more which I could go on about, especially what I would recommend is the uh, criticism or the critique of Laclau and Moved by Ellen Megson Wood, and it's called The Retreat from Class, and it came out in 1986. So moving on slightly, this is a wonderful, magical um, approach to things. And I'm gonna call this second generation intersectionality. Now, this some um, the wheel of power and privilege. Um, the um, Jennifer Nash in her book, describes how intersectionality has been uh, institutionalized and it has lost, as far as she's concerned, it has lost a great deal of its uh, analytical and therefore strategic uh, power. Um, and um, this, sort of, this sort of diagram that we have here was presented to me by a researcher, a postgraduate researcher at a Canadian university. And he presented it to me as a trans woman. He presented it to me and said, what does this tell you about your position? Now, this is quite interesting really, uh, because class doesn't really exist in this. We have got body, body size and housing, uh, language again this was this was quite fundamental um, but yeah I mean I can't find a uh, class within this and so the source of power is mysterious um, and so if I am for example heterosexual and I am white and then I'm close to the source of power but what is the source of power capitalism is not there Neither are social classes there. So this is this to me, I was completely perplexed by this, puzzled by. This. So this is what I would call second generation intersectionality, leap forward about this. So Jennifer Nash writes as a black woman, as a black feminist, and speaks of how intersectionality has ossified, but at the same time, it is used by university departments in women's studies as what she describes as an appropriation a means of ensuring recognition for diversity. The questions both of these, uh, these developments and argues for a black feminism, which moved beyond being the source of inter intersectionality. The world which has co-opted intersectionality is a, dominant, as a, is a dominant characteristic to many liberal academic disciplines. I have to say this, that, that um, as a teacher, I am being offered training in intersectionality, which to my mind, it gives, well, how transformative is this, or how challenging is this, um, is approach, this form of analysis, if it is so mainstream that international um, private schools are adopting intersectionality as part of their policy. Um, because that, to my mind, and a lot of Marxist critics would say, it is possible for intersectionality to go mainstream simply because it doesn't challenge capitalism. And so I might say, oh, I'm an anti-capitalist, but where is capitalism within this view of intersectionality? So Jennifer Nash, um, um, yeah, into the Nash accounts for the intersectionality wars, which have raged in the turn of the century in women's studies 
department. And so the diagram which marked here is typical to my mind of what goes on here. And so uh, Delia D. Aguila, who's, um, um, she's one of the authors in this particular, blah, 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 this particular collection, says the formulator. I mean, she, she, to be frank, if you are a supporter of intersectionality, do not read this book because she's very sharp with intersectionality. And so this is what she says. She says the reformulations of intersectionality by feminists today merely reflect the corporatism of the academy and do increasing subservience to a neoliberal global regime. And so um, let's move on. I'm conscious of the time. I'm going to look at, um, briefly going to have a look at the work of, uh, what's her name, Martha E. Jimenez. Uh, Jimenez is an Argentinian sociologist and she spent um, uh, most of all, all of her working life uh, teaching sociology in North America, in, in the United States. And this is, uh, the picture here is a collection of her uh, essays which came out, I think, in 20, I can't remember. Um, paperback was 2018, so it's quite recently. So, um, so I'm going to base three things, uh, three points, as I say at the top of the page. I'm going to base three things, which I'm going to take from Jimenez, and I'll try to do this as simply as possible because I'm conscious of the time, and I don't want to run over the time, so as we can discuss different aspects of if, <laughs> if there's anyone there. <laughs> um, intersectionality. This is what she says. Um, claims to be a, a form of social analysis, which can then be applied to real world settings. Hill Collins, for example, making these claims refers to intersectionality as praxis. Now, this is something we need to uh, keep in mind that it's not simply a theory, but it's something which we apply. And I would suggest that is the most generous understanding of intersectionality. And that's why it seeped into things like um, education, that's why it's brought in there. So this is where, if we, if we presume it to be praxis, then I think um, intersectionality is something which, uh, which can, can be quite valuable. Um, however, there's always a however. However, Jimenez um, responds by saying that, quote, regardless of the political vo vocabulary, intersectionality is an abstract analytical framework which approaches the study of social phenomena ahistorically um, as um, i.e. in abs abstraction from their capitalist conditions of possibility. Oh, I'm going to have to jump forward to the next slide. So this is what she says. So it is it's an abstract analytical, what's the phrase? Uh, abstract analytical framework which approaches the study of social phenomena ahistorically. Now, um, I'll give you an example. One of the, one of the little um, wedges in the diagram would be about, um, uh, ooh, I can't remember what the phrase is, um, whether, you, whether you're cis or trans or non-binary. Now, I understand, I understand that, to my mind, it is not possible to um, uh, abolish gender because within capitalism, gender has a particular function. If anyone takes the time to read chapter 15, part three of uh, Capital, we'll talk about the bourgeois family and how the family has a particular economic role within capitalism. And thus how gender non-conforming people under capitalism have, um, need to be policed to the point where they are, cease to exist basically. Because if you look at other cultures across the globe, then gender non-conforming people have been, have been um, accepted in North America, in the, the um, South Pacific, in uh, South Asia, in curious places like Oman or Albania. So they have existed for millennia, but under capitalism, no, gender non-conforming people do not perform an economic function that, that which is gender. Now, it would be interesting to, to, to see intersectionality having that sort of historical foundation to where oppression comes from. 
Um, so what, one thing which is very good, which I'd recommend, is, uh, uh, is a lecture by Vanessa Wills, and she uh, titled, What Does It Mean When We Say That Capitalism Causes Sexism and Racism? But Jimenez says that intersectionality does not have this uh, rootedness in it because, um, because it doesn't see um, capitalism as a historical um, experience. Uh, and it really focuses on the here and now. Um, number two, um, as a political strategy, Jimenez notes that uh, intersectionally lack in Jimenez's view an ability to unite the oppressed. So what she says is, for example, is it applicable to all women and all men or just some parts of the population? This strikes me as, um, as, a, as really quite astonishing. Um, for example, um, white, cis, heterosexual men, um, if you go back to the, the diagram, the Wheel of Fortune, are seen as, as particularly privileged. So what you're doing then is actually dismissing the, I don't know, 40% of the working class, 40% of the population. And I know that there are some intersectional groups in the Czech Republic that simply will not allow um, cis, het men to, to take part. And so this is what Jimenez says, if whiteness is rendered male, she writes, and maleness rendered white, um, it is only uh, then not everybody is included in intersectionality, only the hyper oppressed. African Americans have race, while women have gender, black women have both, while white men have neither. So if the, if the aim of intersectionality is creating uh, an opposition to oppression under capitalism, why dismiss? roughly 40% of the population. Um, the, um, so really, this is where it is, um, it, it falls out with the um, um, Laclauan move and their idea of creating this, this coalition. Uh, because if we think about, um, would intersectionality have produced something like Podemos? And what's the name? Um, Chantal Mouffe was very much involved at a theoretical level about creating this di um, discourse for Podemos. And we know what happened to the Podemos. And so in, um, what's the name? In uh, Jimenez's view, um, intersectionality is a reflection of opposition in the face of neoliberalism. And there's a nice quotation which you can't find from Aguila. And she says, <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves a little bit whilst I try and find this uh, quotation. But basically, um, well, I can't find it. Maybe it's in the book. But basically, the presumption here is that intersectionality as a reflection of what neoliberalism is. It is a neo, whilst capitalism is going through this neoliberal moment, intersectionality reflects that because rather than actually focusing on class, it focuses on individual, how should we, descriptions of oppression, rather than looking at the source of oppression, which many of us would say is centered in capitalism. And so in the Wheel of Fortune, we have this rather strange, simply just says power. Uh, and yet there is no idea about these relations. Finally, uh, we have the retreat from class. That's the name of, uh, what's the name? Uh, Ellen Mason Wood's book. Jimenez claims that class is identity, identity blind. It must be borne in mind that the working class are a majority, not only within the total population, but also within the particular populations of the various non-class categories. And so, for example, under trans women, the majority of trans women will be working class. And so, um, just to go off a wee bit at a tangent, um, Ellen Mason Wood uh, produced a, a series of a collection of essays at the end of the 90s, and I wish I could quote from memory, but basically she says, as a woman, I'm more likely to achieve my emancipation through the emancipation of the working class and the overthrow of capitalism than simply focusing on the emancipation of women. Um, because if the source of uh, oppression, um, if the source of oppression of women 
is rooted within capitalism. And a lot of us would be able to say that there is a di direct link between capitalism and patriarchy, then surely the oppression of women will be alleviated and overthrown through, um, through the overthrow of capitalism. Simplistic and no, but this is uh, intersectionality has disappeared capitalism in the way that it's disappeared the working class. Uh, just to carry on, although intersectionality may ignore the fundamental importance of class phenomena, which can serve it, concern it, um, have capitalist causes and call for Marxist theoretical ana analysis. Just to finish off here, Kemenes writes that intersectionality takes the status quo for granted. Now this, to my mind, is I'm, I won't want to be kind and polite and not annoy too many people, but this is the case. If you don't have a historical understanding of oppression, then what you're doing is saying that, that oppression exists in the here and now. You're recording that oppression, but you're not building a strategy based upon an analysis. It can teach people to understand their experience in intersectional terms, while at the same time uh, strengthening the capitalist status quo, which, to, which we have to remind that this intersectionality has gone mainstream. LSE, which is a big university in London, describes itself as intersectional. Um, a lot of training programs, I just received one this afternoon, which is about diversity and intersectionality. So it is not simply mainstream, it is institutionalized. It reinforces, as Kimena says, the understanding that excludes the effect of class location. So I'm gonna be very quick as I can to what we're on 37. I'm gonna try and do this in 90 seconds. I'm gonna read it so quickly that you won't understand a word I'm saying. So this is, this is a response. So this was taken from um, the um, Feminism for the 99% which is a book that came out, I think, 2018. And so it's a very short book and I recommend that everyone should read it. Uh, but this is towards the conclusion. Everything depends on our ability to develop a guiding perspective that neither simply celebrates nor brutally oblit uh, obliterates the differences among us. And so if we want to make use of intersectionality, we've got to think of it as a praxis, but not as a practice which ignores or disappears class and capitalism, but uh, uh, an analysis of capitalism and class, which includes the practice of intersectionality, which is disappear all variety of things. And I think that's the real challenge of intersectionality, not that it, it is rubbish and we should get rid of it, but how should we use it within an analysis of capitalism and class, class struggle? Contrary to fashionable, this is so catty, really, it's so catty. Contrary to fashionable ideologies of multiplicity, <laughs> the various oppressions we suffer do not form an incohate contingent plurality. And again, this is, this is um, a bit cutting towards Laclau and Muth as well. So we need to be able to do this. Um, although each has its own distinctive forms and characteristics, all are rooted in and reinforced by one and the same social system, it is by naming that system as capitalism and by joining together to fight against it, that we can best overcome the divisions among them. With capital cultivates divisions of culture, race, ethnicity, ability, sexuality, and gender. Now, I'm gonna start one more slide and I'll stop, I promise, and I'll be 60 seconds on this. And it's just about reimagining the working class, because if we look at the working class um, as a consequence of neoliberal capitalism, you would look out the window and the Czech Republic say, oh, we don't make it things anymore. But where are those things made? Those things are made on what geographers used to call the periphery. Uh, and so the, the manufacturing has moved to, um, to other parts of the world than Europe and North America. And it is, I'm trying to think of a polite word. It is frustrating when commentators say that there's no longer a working class. The working class does no longer look like what it was 50 years ago, but the working class still exists. And so this is Nancy Fraser uh, writing recently, a very short book. She says the following, a project of unionizing service workers, fast food workers. Okay, the other thing is that within a number of developed economies, the working class is far more racialized and far more, um, how should I put it, uh, gendered than it was 50 years ago. And so this idea of the working class as being a, a white male 
is, is no longer a, an accurate picture. And so this is why Fraser says this, is uh, a project for unionizing service workers, fast food workers, domestic workers, agricultural workers, public sector workers, and more, that is the real game changer. We will have to envision the working class in a new way. So the working class hasn't disappeared, it just looks different. Um, as encompassing all of these occupations, paid and unpaid. And the other thing we think about, should we think of the working class as simply those people who are paid to work? Is, there, is it possible that those people who are working at home, who are providing, providing care work unpaid, are they workers too? Perhaps they are. Um, massively encompassing immigrants, women, and people of color. And that's the end. And so if we have, if we put this up here, that gives you a, a range of things that I haven't referred to all of them. There have been things which I, <clears throat> I've referred to, which might not be here, but they, and there's one of me again. So, oh, I've run out over time, but I think we have 20 minutes left or something like that. So, um, unshare screen. <laughs> thanks, Dan. I think thanks a lot. And uh, I, I guess um, I'm sure we can uh, even share your uh, bibliography on the Facebook page uh, of this event uh, for people who are, uh, I'm sure many people will be interested um, <clears throat> um, to, to explore uh, the literature in their own time. Uh, so uh, I'll just jump in into, into the questions. Oh, we've got questions. Um, so I, okay, here is the first one. <laughs> uh, so what is the proper word for not forgetting about other emancipation struggles than the class struggle? There is a tendency described, for example, by Spanish revolutionaries, uh, Mujeres Libres, forget about the second shift at home. So the, the question is what? Um... <laughs> Maybe is it maybe it's a thought, but in, uh, shall I repeat it? May, maybe if you want to. I don't know. Yeah, it'd be interesting to, to hear the question. Uh, and if it makes reference to Spanish revolutions, then all the better. So could, could you repeat the question? Yeah. Um, what is the proper word for not forgetting about other emancipation struggles than the class struggle? Um, ooh. Oh, I understand the point now. I think, I think really, uh, we could use the word inclusion, we could use the word diversity, but I think those words have been tainted. And again, intersectionality has gone so mainstream that I think we need to come up with another word. But you're quite right. And I think if we were looking at, I mean, I, I have the misfortune to, to read journals from the 1980s. And there's really, there's a Marxist journal called Critique, from the 1980s and the presumption was that we had a choice between class and gender whereas i think a lot of the a lot of the stuff which has been produced now over the past five years or so has recognized that that was i don't know it seems like that was a mistake that that sort of debate there was another good um good book by somebody called uh, michelle barnett and it was about women's oppression today and again, she, at the end of the 1980s, beginning of the 1990s, there was a real watershed. And I think that explains the post-Marxism of Laclau and Mouf and the uh, intersectionality came about more or less the same thing. And, and I think 1989 is not uh, an accidental date. I think there was a watershed. And if you look at feminist writing uh, and Marxist feminist writing, there was a lot of soul, well, maybe not soul searching, but there was a lot of, um, questioning about how do we take this forward and it's taking quite a long time because the, um, there's a very good book which is about called um, I can't remember what it's called but it's by, by, by Lise Vogel I can't remember the name of the book but um, that's written at a watershed moment and she goes back to primary texts in Marxism to be able to say well, it's possible for us to have a unified theory so what word do we use well I think we could this is why I don't want to, um, there's a phrase in English about throwing the baby out with the bathwater, which gives you an indication of how some people lived in the past. Um, and I don't think we should dismiss intersectionality, but 
maybe try and think of a way which, which recognizes that capitalism exists. And instead of having that amorphous word power, we have capitalism and we have an analysis of capitalism. And we know historically where gender and patriotic come from within capitalism. And we do a little bit of analysis of the, uh, of the capitalism and then recognize that other forms of oppression, for example, trans oppression, are structured within capitalism. Um, so we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think that intersectionality is this recognition. But you saw the wording from feminism for the 99% they talked about. Um, they um, very critical. If you read the um, Aguila in Marxism and Feminism, she thinks that um, it has gone mainstream. So some work needs to be done to rescue. This is quite nice. We need to rescue intersectionality from its friends. Um, and so if we come up with a new word for it, inclusion, but inclusion sounds terribly liberal. Diversity sounds terribly liberal. So we could, I don't know, I can't think of, my vocabulary is limited, so I can't think of a particular word, unless you know that word, and you were just testing it. <laughs> okay. Uh... Excellent. Maybe that's something we can definitely all think about. What's the next word? What, what, uh, how, how to name this something else? <laughs> um, okay, so uh, there, I have a note. Uh, so it's a note, it's not a question, but I'll, I'll read it out uh, as, uh, as I just, yeah, I want to read out all the questions. Um, in my opinion, the black and the white is the racism problem. It is not related to feminism nor sex. Um, it is the white mindset which says that it that it is superior. Can I comment? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. For example, gender has a function within capitalism. Uh, racism has a function within capitalism. Um, you're going to tell me, well, slavery is in the Bible, but it's race. Slavery is in the Bible, but racism isn't. And so um, I would, as a, as a historian, um, that sounds very grand, you know, but as a historian, I would say that racism uh, and the language of racism is a consequence. If you can look at it around about the 16th, 17th century. And I don't think it's coincidence that the development of capitalism creates these new ideas, which allows people to enslave others. And the base of that enslavement is often, often the color of their skin. It is more complicated than that. You did have indentured labor, um, in, um, in, the, in the Caribbean. But basically one of the things we have to ask about is maybe racism is within our white psyche, but what placed it there? And the question I would ask is that in all these things, what is the function of racism under capitalism? So I'm not disagreeing with you, well, I am actually, but, the, um, but that's the thing. I mean, the, from, from what is the function of gender? Why is it? necessary under capitalism to have these uh, gendered occupations. Um, and I would counsel everybody to read chapter 15 of, of Capital, especially section three. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, in, in this sense, um, hopefully maybe later we will have another time for our, another space to discuss how the uh, contemporary so-called anti-gender alliances uh, relate to this exactly what, what, what you just said. Uh, yeah, that, that for next time. <laughs> uh, so the next question, uh, maybe I misunderstand it, but there is a wealth on, on the wheel. Uh, does it mean something else than class? Sorry, there's a wealth of what? Oh, uh, and the, 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 related yeah, to that wheel thingy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is um, your guest yesterday, Esther Kovac, is that, I, I can't pronounce her name. She wrote a very interesting article quite recently and about saying that, um, as I understood it, that um, instead of a class, it's status. And so, for example, if you are, it's not to do with your relation. So class is no, is, and in Marxism, class is about social relation, uh, about your relationship with your employee. I mean, I'm very well paid, but I don't have control over my work. Um, and so I'm not completely independent. So it's not an independent in income. I'm told what to do, and I'm very well paid for it, thank you very much. But in terms of my social relations with my employer, those are, are the relations of a worker and an employer. So it's a relationship. Whereas what we have in the Wheel of Fortune 
is that it is um, it is status. So you have well paid, less well paid, and so on. So it really just it's not about class. It's about how much you get paid. Um, and anyone who looks at any sort of economics, for example, um, I suspect that a worker in this country is very well paid compared with workers in other parts of the parts of the world. So really, can we make a comparison there? Rather than saying that a worker in the Czech Republic has particular interests as a worker, but workers in, I don't know, Latin America, um, workers in um, South Asia, simply because a, a European gets paid more than others, does that mean that they have completely different interests? Um, it might be, you might want to think in those terms, but status is not the same as, as class. Um, so that's my response. Great, thank you. Another question, uh, I guess it relates to uh, actually your, um, I guess to your conclusion. Um, uh, so it's a bold question. So if it doesn't have, uh, if it if intersectionality doesn't have uh, doesn't have economical role, then thing is doomed to non-existence and oppression. You mean intersectionality is doomed to? Uh, yeah, I think I think so. I think that that's that's how. No, I mean I think I think one of the things we can. Uh, I don't think intersectionality is altogether bad. What I think intersectionality misses is the context in which we live. And I would agree with uh, Jimenez that, um, I mean, there, there was a very good um, interview with David Harvey, the um, geographer, um, in Jacobin magazine uh, a couple of years ago. And he was saying that um, opposition reflects the, um, the, is it mode of production? The, the, the the stage of capitalism at the moment. And because if we're in neoliberal, neoliberal um, capitalism, then the opposition will be neoliberal as well, that we reflect the conditions in which we work. And so this is his explanation for the development of particular identity, uh, focusing on different identity. Now, um, the response is that identity, Identity is a real thing. It's not something we imagine, it's a real thing. But we need to talk, think about the, the nature of um, uh, identity oppression within the bigger picture. So I don't think intersectionality is altogether a bad thing, but I think we need to locate it or put it back into the bigger picture. Um, and this is why I think it's quite interesting to see intersectionality as a historical moment from the end of the 80s, until why, I, I mean, if you read Jennifer Nash, you would see that she's, she's written the book is called After Intersectionality. It sounds a bit gloomy in that way. But I think as soon as it goes mainstream, then we've got to think about, well, is this really doing the job we want it to do? Um, and I think it's difficult to deny that intersectionality is, is mainstream, it's institutionalized, um, especially in the academy, but also in, in other areas like education. Yeah, education, corporations, uh, and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so here I have an another question a little bit longer. So uh, thank you for the presentation, Diana. You have mentioned that a working class is much more racialized and gendered than 50 years ago. However, isn't it possible that working class has never been white and male and this conception of a working class was merely a romanticization? What I'm aiming yeah, at. I mean, it was in way. Uh... <laughs> sorry, it goes on a little bit. If you don't mind, sorry, Diana, I just want to. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a lot. So, what I'm aiming at, uh, our um, viewer, uh, is that working class today is often depicted as dark, uncivilized, loud, fat, disgusting, which is one of the reasons why it is so uncommon for the working class to organize. So, is it possible to discuss class without a horizontal cultural perspective in neoliberal? Capitalism. Oh, um, do you know? I, I don't. I don't think it's. I think we have to understand. Um, I think you're right. I think historically, um, it is. I mean, I, I, I did degree degree um, which specialised in 19th and early 20th century history, and when you look at the working class, this idea that you had working class women who were at home, and then um, working class men that went down the pit, so they went into steel works. 
It is largely a myth because if you look at other forms of occupation in different parts of different parts of the world, then um, then women obviously very much uh, um, much involved in this. And so you're quite right to say that that it is um, that. I'm not sure it's romanticized, but it's certainly in, in some socialist countries and socialist literature, that these half naked male, male, overly muscled males with their big hammers. Yeah, I don't know whether that's erotic or not, but it might be some people. But yeah, I mean, that, that sort of image is, can, be, can be construed as a romanticized image. Um, and really we need, to imagine, we need to imagine the working class as something, something broader, basically. But I'm, I'm a foreigner. And it does, and, and so really my references to the working class in this country, um, uh, uh, I, I don't want to um, make a stand on that, but it does surprise me because um, my experience, I think Mina Senna was an activist, activist. I was originally in the Labour Party, I was originally a trade unionist, and I spent my, learned a lot of my politics in trade unions. And, and it frustrates and surprises me that in Czech Republic, trade unions are not stronger than they were. I mean, since, since 1989, year again, we have a steady decline in unionization. Um, in the UK, we've reached the point where the majority of trade unionists are women. Um, and if you look at the construction of the trade union movement in the UK, it is quite black, it is quite feminine. So that is the situation in, in the UK. I have read something about unionization in the US. And again, it focuses on industries like healthcare and education, which is no surprise, tends to be, uh, tends to be racialized and tends to be um, uh, gendered as well. So um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think if we have a conversation, I'm, I'm, presuming, the, I'm presuming the caller is from, um, is from the Czech Republic. And so I think we need to, if we want to organize, uh, then we need to think about, well, what do we understand by the Czech Republic in this particular geographical uh, context? Um, and so, yeah, I think it's a real challenge. I don't, think it, I don't think we can simply say the working class, because what we've got to think in terms of is, well, how do we reimagine the working class within this particular context? Um, and I think it is an insult, because this is within the UK, there is a big debate within the Labour Party about how the Labour Party sees the working class. Um, and for under Corbyn and uh, under Keir Starmer, there is this uh, almost like pejorative way of talking about working class people, especially in working class seats, because the majority of those people seem to have just, um, how should I put it, um, uh, rejected, um, uh, rejected the European Union and voted for Brexit. And so there's a lot of commentators talking about the end of class politics in the, in the UK. Um, so there, there is a real challenge. And I think that, that it's uh, to presume that we can sim simply take the working class off the shelf and employ it, we don't have to do it. But it's an engagement with working people, I think is, a, um, is, is not a choice for socialists. Yeah. Meaning that you have, you have to do it, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Uh, and maybe we have a last comment and maybe uh, that, that this is kind of nice way to, to also finish this uh, really great, <laughs> really great uh, lecture that um, lecture discussion, <laughs> sorry. Uh, agree with Diana, racism develops, especially during the um, Illuminism where classification was very important. Classification and distinction started with nature and animals, and they did the same with humans. I also suggest Marco Aimes work for more information. Uh, colors, white, black, and so on are just symbolizing power. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the power of labeling, um, as I understand the, the question. Thank you very much for that question. I have no idea how to answer it. But the, the idea is that, I mean, giving people labels in that sense, um, um, and I think Jimenez um, suggests that one of the weaknesses of, uh, of intersectionality is it puts people in particular boxes. Um, I mean, people look at me, oh, it's a trans woman, and that is my particular box. I say, hang on, there are other aspects of my existence which might be um, quite interesting. 
Um, and so if I'm, I don't want to um, um, misrepresent what the question is about, but I think the giving labels to people is in some ways not helpful uh, because it, it separates more than it unifies. And I think really we should learn the lessons of intersectionality to bring about this uni unified theory because we can't really wish away capitalism. It would be nice if we just closed our eyes and said, it's not here, it's not here, but it is here, it's, it's a present reality. And so we have to recognize that, yes, a multiplicity of oppressions take place, but the source of that oppression is capitalism. So we should use some of the inclusiveness of, um, of intersectionality, but we shouldn't wish away capitalism. It is a present reality and we have to face it somehow. Great, Diana. Thank you so much. I think this is, um, unfortunately, we are, we are already running out of time, but I think this is a nice way how to, how to end this wonderful discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure as always. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for, to Srijeni for organizing this. And uh, I hope everyone has a very pleasant evening. Thanks a lot. And uh, for the rest of you guys, uh, there will be uh, another per, uh, performance. Uh, yes, at 6.30 uh, from uh, Darina Alster, uh, performative, yeah, per performative body. Performative uh, Michelle. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll see you there. And uh, yeah, Diana, thank you again so much. And see you soon. Mm -hmm.